Good evening. Um, I am Yasufumi Nakamori, uh, the uh, new director of Asia Society Museum upstairs, part of the Asia Society's Season of Japan, uh, which began uh, you know, earlier this year, continuing on to the spring next year. Coming out of the exhibition upstairs, uh, uh, major modern 50 years of New Japan, as well as a series of uh, programs uh, focusing on culture, art, economy, and politics uh, of Japan now and also uh, then. Uh, I hope you had a chance to see the show upstairs. It's a brilliant exhibition, uh, which consists of 83 objects. Um, they all come from American collections, uh, museum or individual collections. It's about actually how American collected Japanese art at the same time, you know, what those Japanese artists were doing you know, during the 50 years when uh, Edo you know, period ended and the new era came up. And you know, that was a moment of uh, experiments and also you know, artistic explorations. Uh, just some really beautiful objects in that exhibition. Thanks for coming to uh, the tonight's event. Uh, it is titled, Artist of Rebellion and Rejection, Otake Chikuha. Otake Chikuha, his painting, The Fall of Castle, it's a large painting made in 1902, is included in the exhibition upstairs. Um, Eiko will speak in depth on her grandfather, so I won't uh, talk too much about him, but he was one of the actually a really major artists from Meiji era. Um, then tonight's actually conversation will be between Eiko and also Professor William Johnston, uh, who will co-present a performative talk on a life and work of the painter, Chikuha Otake. Eiko Otake, she's a movement-based interdisciplinary artist who for a long time worked as Eiko and Koma and performed their collaborative works in many theaters and festivals, including Asia Society. You know, as a matter of fact, my first year in America as a student at the University of Michigan in uh, 1989, I saw their performance. So it's great to have Eiko back uh, here. Uh, she's performed many times here at Asia Society. Um, their exhibition, actually Eiko and Koma had many exhibitions in the US, uh, including Time is Not Even, Space Not Empty, a very important uh, a survey exhibition of their performances at the Walker Arts Center in 2011, which I also saw. Um, she shares her own perspectives tonight as an artist and Chikuha Otake's grandchild towards her grandfather's work. Professor William Johnston is a professor of history, East Asian studies, and science in society. Um, his research has focused on the intersection of public health cultural values, and economic and political force. He has many books and, and articles written, uh, including the book, a very important book, uh, The Modern Epidemic, A History of Tuberculosis in Japan. Uh, Professor Johnston is also a photographer. Uh, he also you know, published many uh, photo books and exhibited widely. Eiko and uh, Professor Johnston, you know, has collaborated uh, together uh, visiting uh, Fukushima uh, numerous times, and they created exhibitions and a film. And the book, it's a very important book, just came out in uh, 2021, titled A Body in Fukushima. The screen you're looking at now is a work by uh, Hashio Kiyoshi, uh, created in, in 1915 for the occasion of uh, Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. It's a beautiful work. It's the first work you see as you enter into a large gallery on the second floor. So this is not the work, actually, uh, made by uh, Eiko's grandfather. Thank you.
Japan is an island country. The sea that surrounds it on all sides is at times a barrier, at times it is a bridge. For many centuries, it was primarily a bridge, especially from China and Korea, bringing culture that the Japanese adopted as their own. During the Edo period from 1600 to 1868, it had both dimensions. Often in the West, we say that Japan was closed, a closed country, or sakoku, as it's called in Japanese. But for the Asians, Japan was not closed. Thousands, literally, of ships from China, Korea, the Ryukyu Kingdom, and even Southeast Asia brought goods to the Japanese. The Europeans, however, were limited to contact with the Dutch in Nagasaki. It was when the Americans arrived in 1853 that they gave the Japanese no choice. They said, it is time to open your country to our trade. The Japanese knew that if they were to resist, they would lose in a war. So they signed unequal treaties that were not abrogated for over 30 years. Yet Japan was also at this time closed to itself in that few Japanese during the Edo period traveled abroad. But during the Meiji period, this period of new modernity, hundreds and then thousands of Japanese traveled abroad to study, to learn new techniques, and to bring new cultures into their own land. What we see in Otake Chikuha is an example of this mixing of cultures of the modern from the Europe and the United States and of the traditional Japanese.
As I grew up, I was aware my grandfather was a painter. But he was a scandalous one. So my impression of him was not good. It was not until 2018 I saw this painting, Fall of the Castle, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I was actually quite impressed by the grave sorrowness, sadness, at such a young age he painted, 24. But being 24 in Meiji era meant different from nowadays. I asked the curator, could I have a little private time with this painting? Paris, the curator, said yes. So I danced with his painting before museum opened. This was my first duet with someone who did not exist. He died so long ago. So tonight I am here to offer you some of his words and some knowledge I found. My objective is to use my body as a conduit to so long ago. My voice might give you some idea of who he was. Please imagine and let him linger. The painting, Fall of the Castle, or Rock of Joe, Painted in 1902, as Eiko just said, when Chikoha was only 24 years old, depicts a particularly poignant scene. This was an event that would have happened with some degree of frequency during Japan's Warring States era, between around 1467 and 1600. There were many castles that warlords made their home domain um, headquarters. And when they went to war, the castle became the main object of attack by the enemy. Often the castle would fall, meaning that most of those inside it would die. Here we see an image in which the castle has just begun to meet its end. The smoke is filling the room. You can see it on the top. You can see it as it travels across. And we have the warlord's wife, mother of these two children, and her two um, ladies-in-waiting along with her. Rather than allow themselves to be killed by the enemy or die in the flames, it was the custom for the wife to draw out her dagger, end the lives of her children, and then end her own life. Otake Chikuha was born in 1878, the eleventh year of the Meiji era. His life can be divided roughly into three periods. Early in his life, he proved himself to be a talented painter who was selling his paintings by the age of five in the marketplace. By 1907, he was exhibiting in the national exhibition called the Bunten, where he won numerous prizes. Yet in 1908, he had a quarrel with Okakura Kakuzo, who many of you know from his Book of Tea, after which he left Okakura's group. After that, he entered a later period during which he created many paintings, often called avant-garde, and exhibited widely. He died in 1936, the 11th year of the Showa era. She's 
one of the paintings with which Eiko grew up. As you can see, he loved to paint many of the things that were common around him. He was a master painter of natural objects. It seems fairly clear from his work that picking up on the tradition of artists such as Hokusai, that he was a very close observer of nature. He took his observations and translated them into paintings of subtle and often of stunning beauty. These two paintings would be hung next to each other, and Eiko grew up with them with one painting being shown, or in this case two, every month being changed. Shikuha also was a master at creating the hyoso, the, um, the, the uh, fabric around the paintings used for hanging. These are unusual and, and they were unique. So I saw this picture, three brothers naked, and I was very surprised. It was in a book that my uncle took years to research and write about my grandfather. So I showed this photo to Koma, my partner, and he ran to my mom and said, see, see, this is not my fault that we are dancing naked. <laughs> it's in Eiko's jeans. Whether that's true or not, Koma and I danced naked, naked from 18, no, 19, <laughs> we are not making, 1983 to all the way to 2014. 31 years. So, Otake's three brothers needed each other to be naked. It takes a little bit of bond, so I had coma. So this is my grandparents. While I don't have any sense of clinging to my grandfather, I do have that to my grandma. We lived in the same small house and my only child. So she really protected me. Often, very much my savior, when my mom was trying to teach something, she would say, don't you worry, those are all the rules human beings made. Eiko doesn't have to follow that. I think I came too far. <laughs> <laughs> they were married, but it was with a lot of resistance from my grandma because he had a bad reputation as a flamboyant, so like a scandalful, strange man. But he repeatedly asked her, saying, a painter who wants to be a great artist needs a smart wife. Well, she had that reputation. So these are his children. All the way to the right is my father, Eiichi. I'm Eiko, it's Eiichi, same A. Uh, all the way to the right is my uncle, a younger brother of my father, 10 months younger. But you realize he's bigger because they had a different birth mother. Chikuha had many relationships and he supported all of them for many years. In the middle is my two aunts my father's older sister and the younger sister. They too have different mothers. But they grew up together. And in the, in the sketchbook that Chikuha left, many of the sketchbooks, I often found many sketches of the children. And he writes in his essay very lovingly about looking at a child 
looking at children, they grow up, their eyes, their movement. Here is a family. In the middle is my grandma. She raised all her children from different ladies. But my father, being an eldest son, was taken away from his birth mother almost as soon as he was born and was raised and registered as, as a real child of man and wife, Yae and Chikuha. He did not know the truth. All other siblings had relationships and knowledge, and they often saw their birth mothers. So it wasn't until my grandfather died. That day, one of his disciples very carelessly told my father the truth. He was very upset. And so I would imagine my grandma was. So this is my father in his high teen, very sad looking young man. When war started, of course he was drafted. He was beaten very badly and he died. He had a tuberculosis. It's quite amazing the doctors let him go home. He later told me, if I go to the war, to China, I would be either killed by beaten by my own military or end up killing other people. I did not want to do that. This is me. I think this is, I'm about becoming one. So 1952, I was born. That's the end of the year of American occupation. It was not Allies' occupation. It is America's occupation alone for seven years after the war ended. Japan, Japan surrendered. And I was very close to my grandma. As small as our house, since because my father was the eldest son and my grandma was there, all the family gathered in our house. My mom always cooked. They all drank. And it is at those occasions I heard more scandals. This is a day family brought uh, my grandma's uh, bones to the family grave. This is a grave my grandma made when Chiku had died. She had very little money. He was quite rich at one point because his painting used to sell well. But towards the end, but she wanted to create a rather big grave for him. It is at there I found out my grandma was not my grandma in blood. I felt so awful to her. But at the end, I look back. I think she was a very strong woman. So I grew up with his painting, not really paying much attention but it was very much a routine that my mom would change. And sometimes I loved the frog, sometimes I loved the snake, and I used to play with those characters because I was the only child. And I was noticing, wow, this looks very different kind of a woman than usually depicted in traditional Japanese painting. Woman, mountain, you know, the flowers. I loved some of the ways that he creates movement, so like activities, and that is that painting. I didn't find out. I was looking for this. I couldn't find it. I kind of said Serabi, and then this morning, I remembered where I put it. Did he make it happen? I'm not that kind of person to think that way, but I felt paintings 
want it to be seen. So I brought it. I remember this. As a child, I used to think, this tree needs my help. Here we have a painting that Chikaha did when he was about four years old. He was clearly a prodigy. This is a picture of a Japanese orchid, one of the standard images that one learns when learning how to paint sumie, this style of painting. Yet clearly he didn't take long to become a true master. Before too long, he and his brother had gone to the city of Toyama, which was a city that was the home to traveling medicine salespeople who would take their packages of medicine and go door to door all across the Japanese archipelago. With them, they would bring packages that were designed by very talented artists, in this case, Chikuha and his brother. As a result, Chikuha actually became, his works became very famous before he himself became well known. Not long after this, he and his brother went to Tokyo. There, they created other images for the popular market. In this case, we see this one, which is actually of a kind of board game. Fascinatingly, this is when the United States and Japan and England were all good friends, as you see from the US and, and British flags at the bottom. When Chikuho was 18, he moved to go for good to Tokyo and started creating these kinds of images. Again, this is for the popular market, mixing traditional themes with Western themes, like a cherub with wings in the top right. He was also hired by textbook companies to create paintings for the textbooks. In this one, we see an image taken of a um, Amaterasu, the um, sun goddess, um, based on a tale in the Kojiki, um, the, which was produced in the year 712. You know, Bill? Yes. This actually makes me feel a little disturbed. Yes. I knew his family was very, very poor, and he really had to grow to make money. So I understand how he was excited to get that job, right? From uh, official Japanese government decided um, textbook. But it's very clear that textbook was trying to teach Japanese children to take Japan as more than what it was and take it as a god country, take it as some special country. And he would have known better, but he continued Three brothers continue to do this. So I'm a little bit haunted. So many children throughout Japan were looking at textbook and making the exciting story, feeling it, and not being critical about it. it these were clearly um, propagandistic in their, their motivations. So images such as this and this next one, in which we see this beautiful image of a samurai on horseback surrounded by cherry blossoms, of course, a symbol of, of the evanescence of life um, in Japanese, um, uh, modern Japan, um, especially. Um, my wife, who is Japanese, um, grew up in Kagoshima, said that she uh, imagined her parents looking at these kinds of image, images as they were in primary school. Yet at the same time, he was creating images such as this one, in which we see of a child Kakube Jishi, a child who is a traveling street performer. This is from Niigata area, very special. And again, this is coming from the poor family tradition, right? Kids had to work. They couldn't go to school. They performed on the street or visiting a little better household and performed in their yard. The expressions that he's drawing fields very much remembering his own youth, where he had to survive himself. Yes. Drawn with great empathy. 
These next two paintings are also quite fascinating in that the one on the left is based on an image by the painter Shiba Kokan, who was the first Japanese painter to adopt Western painting techniques in the late 1700s. Um, the Japanese were not closed off, as we often think, uh, in, in, in that even these kinds of painting styles were coming to Japan. On the right, we see a, another image which is much more uh, representative of the Meiji period, in which we see a woman dressed in kimono, which might be considered traditional, but at the same time, she's sitting in a wicker chair, which is completely modern, with a, a, what would be, have been a modern um, hairdress, uh, hairdo at the time. In addition, she's reading a book, which is a sign of her education. He also drew paintings, or made paintings, of women such as these. Clearly a working woman with two children. This was submitted in 1904 to the St. Louis International Exhibition, where it earned a bronze medal. He was 26 years old. It's, he actually submitted to many international exhibitions. And I still don't know how this happened. Do you just want to submit it? Mm -hmm. There has to be some kind of a uh, process of selected. And in Otake Three Brothers, he's the only one who had repeatedly had been shown internationally. And perhaps as a result, in America, I mean, I've been kind of finding out there are many paintings owned by American people. Also in that year, he ex exhibited in the War Painting Exhibition, 1904 being the first year of the two-year, 1904-05, Russo-Japanese War. This I only found out lately. I was actually quite shocked. I, you know, my Otake family, we call it Otake family, what kind of like, you know, left wing. My father was a communist member when being a so was illegal. My mother always voted for Socialist Party. So I thought all my families were pacifist. It was kind of sad that he produced himself a war pictures exhibition. You know, a purely a side note. I think many of us sitting here might have similar feelings about our grandparents. My grandfather on my mother's side, whom I never met, um, I learned something about him, which when I learned it, I thought, oh my God, I can't believe someone in my own family had said something like that. Some of you have seen me dancing with my mother after she died. I realize as I get a little more surprisingly to the place of like personal, I didn't do that with Eikan Koma. But then people take what they remember from their own lives. Everybody has a mother, whether you like it or not. And everybody has grandparents, whether you met them or not. At the same time, he was painting images such as this one of Hikaru Genji from the tale of Genji. Yet this is one unlike uh, any other um, image from the tale of Genji that I had ever seen at least, in which we see almost um, psychedelic colors in the, the painting, the blue, the orange, the red, and Genji himself not dressed. Naked. Which is naked, which is not something which it, it occurs only implicitly in the novel, let's put it that way. <laughs> also, you know, he was aristocrat. So this depicting him naked must be a little problematic. Around the same time, he was also doing paintings such as this still life of, of beef, quite simply. This was the time when beef started Skiyaki. to become popular. And yeah, skiyaki. With skiyaki, indeed. In his essay, one of his essay, he speaks about Skiyaki House with the new things we can eat. There are more active conversations. Of course, with Skiyaki, you have many people sitting around a pot, all chatting with each other, drinking lots of good sake. Lots of drinking. <laughs> 
Here we have a painting from 1910, so a good bit earlier, which was exhibited in the national exhibition, the Boon Ten. Um, it's of a ridge pole, which would have been the top of, of the, uh, the ridge for a temple or shrine. What's fascinating is that along with the aristocrats we see in this image, we see very uh, carefully rendered images of the workers, which is something that we don't really see in many paintings from this time or even much earlier. This is actually from the photograph before he finished. The finished piece has colors, right? Mm -hmm. But so many of his paintings are not existing because he lived in Tokyo. Many of his collectors are from Tokyo. And Tokyo had Taisho period uh, earthquake. So 1923, September 3rd, around 1215, a huge earthquake uh, uh, knocked over the cooking pots of many, many households, making an inferno in which over 100,000 people died. So that probably had destroyed not only Chikuhas, but many painters' works. And those that survived could have also been burned out in by 1945, the Tokyo Air Raids. Yeah. Here, we're also from 1910, we have another uh, piece that won the highest prize at the official art exhibition, the Bunten. Uh, Bunten is a Japanese Education Bureau sponsored a national, probably a highest regard, highest regarded uh, big exhibition where you have to be able to enter, but then select it, and then you could be awarded. And he was awarded in so many exhibitions. He really got a good taste of it. So, you know, he was, he was made a lot of painting that was sold very well. But putting an exhibition means not only buyers, but the people can see it. He was actually quite shameless in ways that he would put 10, 20, 30, 50 pieces to one exhibition, one after the other. No wonder he actually got lots of awards. So this is a first solo exhibition after his death, which is long ago. I was getting a little freaked out that my children has no interest of even smallest things that was left to my home. So I contacted some museums and donated most of the things that they were willing to take. From that came his exhibition. So again, I could dance a little bit. Dancing in front of his picture make me see the parts of the picture more clearly. I can think better when I perform, even when there is no audience. I began to feel how could I know him differently? So you kind of get his rambunctiousness a little bit, the way he was um, you know, sending his works to the exhibitions. But wait until you hear this. <laughs> this is an opinion piece that he put and they published because he was a well-known scandalous person. So of course, newspaper would publish it. Here go. Art lovers tend to think what is popular or what art galleries praise is good, good painting. As if paintings are stocks, they think owning them will bring a higher price. This is not to love art. Remind you, he's writing this in 1911, some time ago. If people regard paintings as investment, I have to protest as an artist. Today's art lovers do not study using their own eyes. In selecting and buying painters, they use their ears, listening to other people's talk. Why do they need to get a recommendation? I want them to trust their own eyes. I want them to feel sympathy to the painting itself. 
When our work becomes popular, artists might feel cheerful. But if we try to please buyers, the painting loses their spirit. There is no artistry. Art critics are also lazy in training their eyes. Artists are afraid of critics, but we do not paint to be reviewed. We should paint bravely. Everyone knows eyes are important in painting, but few speak about ears. I want painters to train their ears rather than eyes. A painting does not move, but music moves, sound up and down. Music makes us active. If I draw a line listening to music, the line becomes interesting. If there is no emotion, that line has no meaning. We need to listen or imagine the sound as we draw. Ears are critical. When I draw a person laughing, I need to be hearing that laughter. Here we see a painting from 1913, which was a bit of a turning point in his life. He put a great deal of work into this image, which is of a procession of people on their way to the historical Buddha's funeral about 2,500 years ago, as he imagined it. He thought that this would be a painting that would be highly praised, but it won no prizes and was indeed at times ridiculed. This image, like many of the others, as Eko mentioned, um, does not survive to the present day. It was destroyed either in 1923 or in 1945. Yet Eko reproduced from a very small photograph this larger reproduction of it. Having received the criticism from this and other paintings, Chikuha was a bit incensed. He ran for a seat as a House of Representatives. His campaign objective was to change and improve the visual arts that he thought had been too uh, politicized. He was completely unskilled as a political campaigner and after losing was left with a huge debt. So, he was wounded, so one of the kind of inexpensive but popular painting of sun and the sea, he started to mass produce. And in Japanese traditional art, nobody has done that before. And usually you can change a little bit, but he didn't do that. So he was completely baffled, registered, uh, shouted down. From that, only two years later, this is a year my aunt, his first child, was born. And I can see this is a four panel big painting. But though he was tired and wounded and perhaps angry to himself and the others, I see people being smiling with each other. So many different plants are in the panel. And he writes and talks a lot about living the life in tune, looking at the land and what the land can produce. Bill, do you want to explain how this title com comes? Sure. So this, this word toki in Japanese, meaning time, um, comes from the Chinese character on the left which consists of the radical for sun on the far left, and on the right is the radical for temple, which actually consists at the top of land and underneath with a measurement of about an inch, he soon. He, for, to make this image on the cover, he disassembled this 
made the sun into the round sort of uroboros at the top that's now eating itself, the land, and then the soon underneath with volume one, issue one, written underneath there. So the first essay, so this is his own magazine, right? And he's a publisher and he's an editor-in-chief. It goes, first essay, where we live on the land are fire, water, humans and animals. Plants and trees are silent and stay at their places. They do not walk away, but grow upwards. Only humans and animals shout, sing, and hop around. People do not time. Toki is time. Time tells us, but we do not know time. The past does not return and the future approaches fast. He follows with a greeting. Bear with me. I'm publishing a magazine, Time. I will write here what I think and exchange our thoughts with you. For a long time, I have wanted to publish my own magazine. I'm finally doing it. I want not only professionals, but people of every background to contribute writing. I want to continue this publication for years to come. It only got one issue. There was no second issue. I actually did the same when I was 19. There's something there. <laughs> Let me continue. I'm not sure if printed material has any power in society. It might be more powerful to hear one's thoughts directly from the person. I do not know how to write well, so I do not ask you to read my writing, but to hear it in my voice, as if I'm talking to you in my studio, my home, or while getting drunk. Well, alcohol runs very deep in my family. <laughs> I want you to enjoy the realness of being human. And this is the only drawing he included in this magazine. All the rest is essays. And here, I was just, you know, it's one of those things like, I saw this, I was already in my 60s. To select one, drawing with one aunt. I happen to be asking all my students when I teach, have you ever killed an aunt? And almost always everyone's hand is up. He probably had done that too. But he says here, anything that lives desires food. I see his intention to put himself ourselves, any one of us, to be the connecting life force. Looking at fly, looking at snails, we have life. That is our commonality. So as a matter of fact, Koma and I have done a work with seals. I have made a piece about moss. I look at... Um, what is the thing? The one in Obenjo Maggots. I did a lot of maggots movement. <laughs> and next one. A favorite of our students. <laughs> yes, yes. And you did that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't it? Can you do the next one? This is my self in 1986 here on this stage with Coma. This was a river that people have to cross to die. I think I was told then, that day, I was the first commandai. Well, actually, Kuma wasn't naked in this piece, even though in other pieces he often. In this piece, I was only one. So I was the first naked body in this building. <laughs> Here we have three images that he did later in his life that clearly reflect 
the, his absorption of modernism. You know, while on the one hand, he truly was a master of drawing from nature, on the other, he also used ideas taken from um, Russian um, uh, um, propaganda posters and German uh, expressionism and similar movements. To be a painter is a commitment to use your own time to look and paint. So I had a, a good time focusing to some details and finding out something I didn't see it the day before. This piece is in a museum in Japan, so of course I can't get it out. But in the exhibition, I could bring my body. You know, Eiko, for me, a good work of art is one to which we repeatedly enjoy and continue to see new things in. My mother, being in a family all the way until she was dying, she enjoyed going to the exhibitions. And when she started to lose memory, so she couldn't follow TV, she couldn't follow film, she loved seeing paintings. And this is the year my father was born, so it makes me feel something about it. But it is very sorrowful, sad piece, and the human being is stuck being a human for next. So those are the ones that he's submitting to every big, small exhibitions, but those are more like illustrations, frog and uh, goldfish and grasshoppers are those titles. Do you want to tell us quickly, Bill? Yeah, so in, uh, let's see, this would be 1924, um, that he, um, the, the caption at the bottom says, you know, Otake Chikuha raises his flag of opposition to the Teiten, the official government's exhibition. So this was kind of a move, something like a Salon de Refusé or uh, something like the Armory Show that took place in, in 1913 here in New York City. Um, as you can see, it was well attended. He also started to paint in the Western style. And in 1922, for this ex national exhibition, he submitted um, uh, 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 paintings to all three divisions of painting, Western painting, uh, Japanese painting, and then uh, not just painting, all three divisions of art, I should say, and to sculpture. And he did not get any award from any divisions. You can see him here painting um, something of an ethnographic image. Um, I think this is how he imagined Papua New Guinea to be. Here we see uh, uh, an image from a magazine, and it says um, the, uh, the lost soul of Chikuha um, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, the work of uh, in, in his wrong field. And of course, he's doing a, a sculpture here. He also um, submitted, starting on January 1st, 1925, 110 daily essays to the Yomiuri newspaper, in which he wrote both the essays and created the images being used. This one being yin and yang, the sun and moon, male and female, this one of a mountain, this one of food, somebody carrying uh, um, uh, um, bundles of rice uh, that were just harvested. So, he was worthy, he was loud, he was too much. This is a poem book he also published. What is beauty? Humans are strange to comprehend. Before you wonder aloud, what is beauty? What is it? Where is it? Please make your mind naked, naked, and see. Oh, our world, the cosmos, and our living are all so beautiful. Anger, lament, crying, sorrow, joy, laughter, and whispers. 
words, voice, body, hand, foot, and hair. Why this not beautiful? Sun, sky, tree, weed, rain, wind, and thunder. Why not all beautiful? And house, smoke, gear, factory, car, train, airplane, crowds, rows of people, traffic, and shadows. They all run, dance, play, stumble, rise, jump, hesitate, make noise. He was loud, too loud for many people. He also writes many one-line poems. I will only give you one. A bag bites me and blood all over my body starts to move. Blood all over my body starts to move. Sometimes, I feel it. Late in his life, Chikoha bought property in Hokkaido, where he planned to create a kind of artist's commune. Um, unfortunately, like many of his projects, it didn't succeed completely. But as we can see, many of the paintings that he created at this time are absolutely beautiful. Oh, that piece is actually in a collection of Boston Museum. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, this is the Museum of Fine Arts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we see takenoko, um, uh, um, the uh, bamboo sprouts as they're coming up out of the ground. These are from a book of, of, of paintings uh, that he did that were photographed, and only in the form of the photographs do these paintings now remain. This is after he died. The same year, my grandma published it. But publisher name is printed as my father, eldest son. I remember when this came from my upper uh, dresser. I saw this. Strange. This is Hokkaido, Akan. And I was kind of surprised how he uses people as a measuring stick. Because this is exactly what Bill and I were talking as we did a project in Fukushima. I used to tell to Bill, I don't always have to be in the center of the picture. You can see the four people climbing up the slope, in the lower, lower left just off the center, and then in the top, uh, in the middle right, um, just above the crater, you can see four uh, figures, one squatting down and three standing. I actually enjoy seeing his sketchbooks, and I kind of see like us, dance artists, working in a studio. We have no promises. We don't know what we are doing. We are just working. He did that. So he sometimes goes over the center line when he feels like it. And this one really made me think, oh, so he didn't really look at the photographs to paint. He really had a connection to the eye, between eyes and hands. A close observer of nature. Who is this? He did not know me.
I will close this part of the evening. We'll talk to you after with one more essay. Rambo, 1929. I do not intend to paint well. I just want to paint, so I do. I do not worry about the result. It is not important to me if people like me or not. Sounds like me. <laughs> I don't paint, however. I want to surprise people. I want to hear their gasps. I want to engage in many aspects of the society, but I'm not educated. So, I want to learn. When I was 20, I tried to see myself at 40. Then I saw I was not good enough for 40, so I worked hard. I have a mission to create a large-scale, profound work. I still have not achieved this, but I will not die until I do. My paintings are no good until people stop telling me I paint well. Art should be beyond skilled or unskilled, expensive or inexpensive. Art without sincerity has no value. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. What a pleasure. Eiko, you know we've been working together 18 years. No wonder I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Speaking of which. So art has no value without sincerity. I didn't say that, he said. <laughs> Says your grandfather. Said my grandfather. It, it's such an evocative um, opening and closing that I wonder if you could just give some of your thoughts about what that means. And actually, that could go from, for you too, Bill. I'd love to hear from both of you what, what that brings up. I've been asking myself a lot why I'm still here in this country. <laughs> I've been here since 1976, you know. And I think bottom line is I have friends here. And with friends, I can be honest. And I can say things that I don't want to say in public. And if we don't say things, our mind go sleep. So for me, lots of gutsy talk is my way of living. So part of that is being awake being awake and then taking that out into the world. Bill? Thank you for that. And I mean that with great sincerity in that, you know, for many years, like literally since the early 1990s, I got enamored with photography, shot 35 millimeter, printed my own prints, got enamored with large format, made platinum palladium prints for many years. And it was after seeing some of those platinum palladium prints that Eiko actually came to me and said, hey, want to go to Fukushima together? And I'm like, I'm not, I don't shoot performers. And she's like, no, come on, we'll go. And the basis for that was that we could work together because we've already been teaching together for what, seven, eight years at that point, um, class on, on Japan and the atomic bombs, as you mentioned earlier. Um, in the past few years, though, I mean, I've been doing something which I also started doing as an undergraduate, starting in 1975, um, which is a great deal of zazen, seated meditation. 
Um, and the, the thing, if there's anything we strive for in seated meditation, it's to be awake. How do we awaken? How do we awake to the world around us? How do we be sensitive to what's happening and give empathy? It's hard. I sometimes get so, so filled with uh, sadness yeah. and anger and annoyance. So sometimes I just continue to walk because that's the way sometimes I can look away. But then, if it's not for you and for others, there's no need for me to do the work. So it's, uh, it's complicated. But, you know, Eiko, it's something that, you know, the whole time we've been working together, you know, starting with Japan and the atomic bomb, and we, we first met at the Center for the Arts at Wesleyan University when I was invited um, by the director at the time, Pam Tachi. And she was working on her master's degree in, um, it was on the literature of the atomic bomb. And I said, wait, you know, I've been wanting to teach a course on this for ages. Maybe we could do it together. And it was... There we started working together and then working with Fukushima for many years and then now a number of other projects. And it's something I've come to think a lot about lately is how, you know, especially at this very moment we're in in the world, of how we see tremendous terror, horror, just the worst kinds of things we can imagine. And I have to remember that always at the same time when there is something horrible happening, there is also something of great beauty always at the same time. So to be open and almost become impossible to move because of the horror. If I can turn and just look at the sky and see the sunset, if I can just turn and look down and see the ginkgo leaf fallen on the, on the corner right here and think, ah, the ginkgo leaf, yes, this is something really beautiful that immediately takes me back to a horrible place, which is Rakujo, where we're seeing this last moments of a family. And on one of those kimono, if you look closely. So I want to take this from the idea of being awake or aware to the idea of intention. The idea that, that uh, a movement artist, a dance artist, a movement artist, an interdisciplinary artist, is in fact in, in dialogue with the world in a different way. So I'm... I'm Bear with me for a moment. I'm thinking of Sam Miller, who had the idea uh, that dance artists, that you couldn't just have the arts on campus and the humanities and the sciences, that, that it was the dialogue, the interaction, the dynamic. And really, that's what brought the two of you together. It was that vision that, that artists are always in, in dynamic contact and dynamic dialogue in, you know, that it's that dynamism that makes the arts so powerful and that often gets obfuscated because we have these kind of pillars. So I just wondered if you could, could say a little bit about that experience of, of taking dance or movement arts into the academy and then working together, this is really for both of you, to to explore in some way that maybe you hadn't had the opportunity to do before? I, all my teaching career, I teach in three schools, but only one course, so I'm not a department teacher, and I can take time or year off as much as I want to, which I appreciate, but actually started with Sam and Bill. And it's not easy. And I can't be teaching all the time. I really can't do that. But having an access to the mind of young people, and I have a group of young people that I really get to know, and I can give all the great books that I love, love, love. And those are the, by authors that young people would never read because those are authors that are not known in America. So it saves in a hard day that I have young people to give and make food for and receive a phone call from them. So thank you, Bill. Well, and Eiko, thank you for all that you've contributed. I mean, it was amazing, you know, when you came to my classes, I, I had always 
had this hunger for something more. I mean, we would sit down, talk about texts that we'd read. I'd try to put energy in. Somehow never just quite got where I wanted it. And then when Eiko started coming to my classes, these magic moments happened where we would engage in movement, pure movement. And we'd be reading these texts, often very, you know, extensive, you know, sometimes very complicated. Dark. Dark, very dark. And then we would start doing things like getting down on the floor, and I would put on my sweats and get down there, and we would all become maggots. For 45 minutes. <laughs> That's or, just the beginning of the maggot world. <laughs> or doing other kinds of movement um, uh, exercises. One that I remember extremely, just sharply in my mind, was where you had students gather together in a circle. We had about 12 or 14. Gather in a circle around this large bowl of water. And I think you had them all put their finger in at the same time, something like that. Because um, they were all sort of radiating out from this. And up until this point in time, as some of you probably are aware, when you get a classroom full of students, they're not really comfortable with each other. They don't really want to say what's on their mind because they don't want to look foolish or, you know, something like this. And try to tease them out where they can trust each other. And I found that having done that or, you know, become maggots with them or whatever it took, that suddenly the trust that they put in with each other and as a result became intellectually adventuresome was just miraculous. Well, you know, hearing this, that's in a way Chikuha did in his salon. You know, he said, I'm not educated. I don't really read well. I don't write well, but I can listen well. And there's always many people, including anarchists, socialists, some people more conservative, different kind of artists from different countries, actually, were in his house. And so hearing that makes me feel this is how I learn, and I can help other people to feel that way. So you're right. Let's open this up. If we could bring the house lights up a little bit, you know, just raise your hands. Yes, uh, coma. You may. Let's start coma. with coma. My partner, coma. Coma. Thank you for being a beautiful conversation. I'm Echo. Echo. I'm sure. I'm sure some of the audience would feel the same way. You know, thank you. You know, the all the. It's a beautiful environment. You know. Just I'm missing, or you're wearing beautiful costume. Could you do some movement? I'll let you go away, go away. Just go away. Okay. Just move, just move. <laughs> just, you know, yes, okay. And give you a microphone, every two, some small movement, you know, with your grandfather and all the painting. <laughs> Thank you, Coma. Let's have a conversation about this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, both of you. Uh, I've been with you for the last 10 years, and uh, I've never failed to be impressed by how fearless uh, you are. Uh, taking on the atomic bomb, taking on Hiroshima, taking on Fukushima, etc. 
Um, but I don't recall ever noticing uh, an element of filial piety before. And I want to ask you, how does this fit with this uh, fearless and uh, challenging and moving uh, worldview? And where do, you, where do you put this? Well, you know, when Kom and I were working together, we are two different people. So we had to work where we can meet. So we didn't really do anything personal. So when I start to dance alone, I start to stay at people's house, I start to go out with other friends, and they will talk about personal things. So I think leaving Ek and Koma format and becoming traveling alone made me more chance to speak about or maybe answering to the questions some people began to ask. Also, I was taking care of my mom before my father. So it made me know what it is, not only about living, but dying. And then I also lost quite a number of friends. So I think a lot about how those people lingers in me. And in a way, it's some of my family things. But I'm not at all interested in talking about my family. That's the least thing I really want to do. But this was an opportunity. <laughs> it was an invitation. But reading his essays in the middle of the night, I remembered some of the paintings I grew up with. So, you know, again, I, I told you very clearly, I am not here as a proud grandchild, not at all. If anything, what is queer, English? Um, an offering. Well, it's not, it's queer to me, it's like, okay, so you have, like, you know, all the no story, no theater tradition, sometimes Shite, the main person, will come and move and tell the story. And so often, those are the person who was killed, betrayed. So you bring back the story, and you learn, and you sympathize, right? So um, it kind of happened by reading the book about him, seeing the pieces all over the different parts of the world. So it was an encounter. It just happened to be my relative. But I don't have the sentimental feeling. I'm actually thinking, what is this guy? He's too much. And every time I complain, Koma said, like you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's there. <laughs> Maybe it's because you're related. Well, it's really true, you know. It was not his painting. It was really his writing. I began to feel like, what? The syncopation and the too muchness and like, like kind of like a simple vocabulary. Being here, I think it lives in my body. And Eka, I remember you were saying that before you became a performer, you had hoped to be a writer. Oh, there was not even hope. I was very clear. Like from that, I was lots to do with my grandma. Just like started very early my love of books and reading. Um, so, I realized in the teenage time, I have nothing to say to the world. So I began dancing, but I love words, and many of you know that. Hi, hi Eko, hi Professor Johnston. Um, my question is about the methodology of this entire process, um, and what was it like going through this personal archive and trying to compare that with the historiography of the Meiji era? What were the biggest discrepancies between the personal and the national archives? And what was the clearest meeting points that made a lot of sense when it was uncovered? Um, you know, one of the things that, that really jumped out at me is the way often we, being one of the uh, 
um, culprits here, um, teach uh, history, Japanese history in this case, um, is with a certain kind of narrative that follows a structure that you know, many people have repeated. And what we forget is that any, uh, at any one point in time, things are really complex. And what's wonderful about you know, looking at Chikoha's work, learning more about his life, is how his, his life and his life trajectory didn't always fit in this framework. So that on the one hand, yes, he was you know, something of a conformist. He did these um, textbooks, um, these kinds of works. On the other hand, he was something of a renegade, which is, you know, in, in Japanese, the old, you know, deruku ga the, the nail that, that sticks out gets beat back in. Well, he was certainly a, a nail that was happy to jump out in many respects. Um, and in that way really goes against, I think, what we expect of, you know, the Meiji person in many ways. I skipped so much part of my education because I was a busy, busy child. Um, so I didn't really study the modern history because somehow school year ended before I got to Meiji. So I had very little knowledge. But I knew before Meiji, if I'm to read, I wouldn't necessarily understand it. Letters, words, grammars. But starting Meiji, what it is, I can read it. And so many of the people, like first to be called feminist, and Akiko Yosano, for example, the great poet, was born in the same year as my grandfather, as a, as a guy, Tsubou Shoyo, who really revolutionized the Japanese theater, was from that same era, Natsume Soseki, and Mori Ogai, all those names who are some of you who know Japanese literature, they are all there. Fujimura Tosong, and those are the ones I grew up. You know, nobody grew up reading your own generation. You read before, before, before. But those guys wrote with the same language as contemporary Japan. So Meiji is actually this turning point that I can still look back and read and understand without any formal education. So it was kind of exciting for me to imagine him and knowing all the other important names in my life come pop and down and realizing his house was actually quite a salon. And he had so many paintings that co-signed by those famous poets or composers, you know, and that was a little joy, but I didn't want to bring that because it was just my personal pleasure and I would really not be the one who brag about it because I'm still staying critical to him. <laughs> okay, I got that. <laughs> staying critical. Uh, Adieu for my grandma's sake. You know, it's so enlightening, and I have to say thank you to Allison, who's here from JASA, because we were at a meeting about the exhibition, about almost a year ago, and, and she mentioned, you know, Eiko Otake's grandfather has a painting in this show. Did you know that? Do you know her? I was like sitting on my phone like going, Eiko, we have a painting that's, are you interested? And she's like, oh, you better have it because I'm going to create something around this. You know, so there's, there is, in a way it goes back to your question about how do we tell history or how do we tell, how do these things emerge and start to reshape how we think about history or family or our own next future? It, it just felt like uh, there was something that unfolded. And, that's, and tonight really felt that way of, okay, we're just going to try something. And uh, I just really hand it to both of you that you made this such an interesting discovery. I, I, I felt like it was amazing. I see what, you're gonna be the last question. Okay, we'll take one, two, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, not because we want to, but we have to. Um, I'm friends with Jun Sun, who I believe is a oh. uh, cousin. Yes, yes. She's, also the grand, uh, she's also the granddaughter of Chikuha. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a painter, so she and I came here uh, maybe three weeks ago, 
and she stood in front of the painting, your grandfather's painting, and I got a great photo of her. Um, but, and she's told me some about your grandfather. Uh, however, she's, I think, a really strong uh, kind of rebellious woman. She's a Buddhist nun and does a lot of peace walks all throughout the world. It was from the outside and the observation of you as a movement artist and her movement throughout the world, the rebellious spirit and coming down from your grandfather, I think is uh, very interesting. Well, wow, thank you. Actually, out. it allows me to say, you know, sometimes I am the only child, so I don't have elder or younger siblings. Um, but jun Sang is actually one of those cousins who would always tell me what to read. Okay, I actually have two questions, so I'm sorry, but I think they are both about, like, history and kind of straightforward, um, maybe. Uh, the first one is I just, I think this is the simpler one. Um, when you're talking about that his, he was the first person to reproduce his paintings, but there was like a, an extensive history of printmaking, right? So were those prints also never reproduced exactly? They always had changes? Or? Uh, sorry, let me, can I just say, maybe I didn't say it right. So he, act, he didn't make a reproduce of printing. He actually made a lines of disciples, and one person just does this side of the moon or this side of the sun. And so it was very much reproducing the painting itself, okay. which was very accused. Yes. Okay, thank you. You know, just, and just as a side note, it's, it's rather amusing that he was castigated for doing this because, as many of you I'm sure know, p painters like Titian had similar kinds of processes. Uh, but then, you know, kind of friend said, don't do it, just change something so each one becomes original. And he said, no, this is how people know about this. This was a kind of well-known painting, small, I mean. Um, and he said, this, I need money, but also I can enjoy people all over Japan. If they want my painting, they can get it. So price going down is actually welcome. So he was never said sorry, and he just went on doing it. He was too much. <laughs> okay, and the second question is, I guess, maybe more opinion-based, but I'm just wondering um, why the Buddhist um, um, death funeral one was ridiculed, because that is surprising to me, I guess. Okay, so I never went into any of those things very deeply, right? So I had to rely on the things I could read, and uh, um, my uncle, who was a freelancer, he was in Sovi uh, Siberia for four years uh, as a POW. And he made this book, right? And he really took his life, really. You know, he had no money. He really had to go. And in here, he talks very much, and he did lots of research, but not computer research, no internet, right? So he's talking. It was at his height of the career that three brothers were getting all the awards, you know, sometimes bronze, sometimes silver, first or second or fifth. That one year, three brothers, no award. So that's when he got very angry because there was a clearly politics were going on. Uh, Yokoyama Taikan, who is actually the most important guy of that generation, important, as said, important very talented painter, I had a big quarrel with uh, Chikuha over one lady. And she stayed with Chikuha. And then there were ongoing battles with Okayama, uh, Oka, Oka, Okayama, no. Okayama, ten, uh, Okakura Tenshin. Oka, Okakura Tenshin, which is or Okakura Kakuzo. Kakuzo, who also had a very big quarrel. And those are the people who created or studied at Japanese Imperial Art School. There's a kind of clan, and so um, book says, and I was told by others, this famous Okakura, who did a book of tea, some of you know, and he was a curator of Boston Museum of Fine Art, of the, all about the Chinese and Japanese art. He said, too bad, Chikuha is great. He speaks too loud and he has no education. 
So that has been repeatedly said about him. And then uh, Yokoyama Taikan repeatedly also said, I studied painting in school. Chikuha studied selling it on the street. So there was this kind of despise of his poor bringing. I tried to deliver it without too much emphasis because it's not my direct experience. Um, I just wanted to say very briefly, um, if you haven't had a chance to look at the exhibition upstairs, please come back when it's open and do. Um, it is really quite amazing, and you get a, a wonderful sense of what Meiji art possibilities were like and how they mixed up things in ways that had never been done before in Japanese history. Um, so thank you for making it happen. And again, I just want to thank both of you for your generosity and thoughtfulness. Thank you. Thank you. And thank all of you for coming out on Saturday night.